your host, nationally acclaimed speaker and author, Debbie Georgiatis. Ladies Can We Talk starts now. Good evening and welcome and thank you so very much for tuning in to Ladies Can We Talk. I want to find a different new line to say at the start of the show because I feel like I always say we have so much to talk about tonight and the two hours will race by. Um, and this is Ladies Can We Talk. I do want to just give you a quick run through of what we're going to be talking about in the next two hours. And the show, Ladies Can We Talk, is always about the idea of standing up and speaking up for really the goodness and greatness of America, appreciating our precious country, understanding why it's great so we can keep it the way it is. We can perpetuate its greatness. Tonight we have um, several different guests coming on. We have in this very first hour in the next segment uh, two young men I actually just met this week. They are students at SMU and they are the leadership team of the Young Americas Foundation um, organization at SMU's campus. The reason I want to have them on is we've had several shows recently talking about how crazy things are on many college campuses. We had last week on this show Dr. Carol Swain who is a Vanderbilt professor professor who's being driven out by student activists or they're trying to do that and we've talked at great length about what's happened at Mizzou so I wanted to have some young conservatives from an SF, from SMU talk to you about what how college campus life is like from the conservative view and what they're trying to do to bring the conservative message to students so they'll be on in 15 minutes um I also have someone coming on uh, at 6.45 who's been on the show before. His name is Scott Ott, and he, uh, Scott Ott is one of the three gentlemen who does, and many of conservatives follow this uh, group online. It is the PJ Media or PJ TV group. And it's Bill Whittle, Steve Green, and Scott Ott. And Scott Ott is a very funny, entertaining, humorous, just a humorous political commentator. He founded Scrapple Face years ago as a website. And he lives in Texas now. We're so glad he does. And so he's going to come on and talk about some of the things President Obama has been saying. He actually offers very insightful commentary. And usually it's kind of funny, too. The second hour, we're going to have on a gentleman named Russ Ramsland, who is running for U.S. Congress. He's, a, he's actually a neighbor of ours that lives a few blocks away, and he's running for U.S. Congress uh, from CD32, Congressional District 32. So we'll talk with him at the top of the second hour about why he's doing that and what, he's, what his priorities are. My leading ladies in the second hour, which I'm always so grateful that I have them join me this second hour, are Chris Davis and Jenny McGarry. So we have a great show lined up. And I always urge you, get out your, your paper and your pen, because I try to always give you talking points in this uh, quest to have all of us speak up for America more and more. But this first segment, I always tell you, is my Speak Up for America segment. Tonight, what I want to talk about in just the remaining few minutes I have in this first segment is what you may have been hearing about on the news and on the Internet and kind of in just political conversation, this idea of a brokered convention and what that means to you. And I always try to tie our stories back. What does this mean to you? Because many people, and honestly, especially women, our plates are full. We have jobs, we have family life and kids and responsibilities. And we can really often don't have enough time to dive in and understand what's being talked about politically. Or we tune in kind of late and say, gee, I don't know, that was going on. So I want to talk with you about what this brokered convention idea is as being floated and why it does really matter to the integrity, not just of the election process, but really the entire idea of what America is supposed to be. In short, there was a meeting this past week that uh, in Washington, and it was attended by the very top niche of leaders in the GOP, the Republican Party, and the RNC, the Republican National Committee. And the meeting, I believe, was called by Reince Priebus. And as ha happens in meetings like this quite often, someone tells reporters afterward what was discussed. What they're talking about is this. Right now, we have all these presidential candidates, and I'm just going to talk about the Republican side right now. I've honestly lost track of the exact number. However many are still left on the Republican side, 10 or 12 candidates. And those candidates are going around states and making speeches and trying to get supporters. Well, ultimately, starting with the first of the primaries, or it's actually a caucus in Iowa, the voters get to say, okay, we've heard all these 10 or 12 candidates, and they're going to choose on primary day their favorite one. And so every candidate is who can get on the ballot in all these states is making a push to have their candidate win. Every candidate is trying to win states. Okay, so how this nets out and gets us to how we get to who becomes president is this. So all these primaries happen. Iowa goes first. We're going to talk later about Ted Cruz surging in Iowa and what's happening in the polling there. But after that, 
ultimately these these uh, elections that happen in primaries are every state has delegates to the national convention and i'm skipping some steps in the middle but we're going to get to the national convention which is what matters and our GOP National Convention this year is in July. It's in Cleveland. It's the third week of July. I think it starts July 18th. So tell, here's what happens. So all these candidates show up. All, excuse me. All these delegates show up from states, and delegates are proportioned based on the population in the state. So let's say that we still have six candidates in, or, or I don't know how many we could have in. So we get to the convention, and on the first vote, when all, everyone who's an actual delegate from a state has the right to vote, let's say that we don't get a winner out of that first vote. Let's say we have, you know, someone gets a plurality, they get the highest percentage of votes, but they don't get, they don't win right out. So after the, and on that first vote, every delegate is obligated to follow the rules of their state. They're committed. They're committed delegates to a particular candidate who won their state. I'm simplifying this for purposes of making this political point, which is really the point of it all. But I want to have you understand what all the machinations are behind the scenes. So let's say we don't get a winner after that first vote. Well, then what happens is various supporters of different candidates start to make deals. They say, look, you know, I was really for so-and-so and and you're for so-and-so and and let's all throw our support behind so-and-so. They cut deals. They're brokering. And that's where the term brokered convention comes from. But why people, especially conservatives, are so concerned about this particular 2016 GOP convention in Cleveland in July of 2016 is that there's great concern among many conservatives that the party is so, I can't think of a good enough word, outraged, frustrated, befuddled by the fact that outsiders are seeming to be the highest vote getters in all the polling we can look at. Donald Trump's been the lead for a long time. Ted Cruz is surging. He's very much an outsider, even though he happens to be a member of the U.S. Senate, very much an outsider. So Ted Cruz, uh, Donald Trump, Ben Carson, and Carly Fiorina is another outsider. Well, in Washington, this establishment class, these people who've held office, are not just concerned, they're really to the core of their being shaken by the idea that some outsider might become president and that outsider might not play the game that they've set up in Washington and that's been played for decades and decades. The game that says, okay, so all of us GOP candidates, we run back to our states, we give speeches, we promise we're going to stand up against President Obama and his illegal amnesty. We promise we're going to stop all these Obamacare you know, special executive orders. We promise we're going to stop this Iranian deal. So these GOP candidates run back to the states, make speeches, get elected, go to Washington, and never listen to the voters again. They go to Washington and capitulate to President Obama, which is why the outsider candidates in the primary are doing so well. Why the voters seem to want an outsider like Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. So we get back to this brokered convention thing. The concern among conservative activists is that the GOP will almost hope that there is no outcome that gives a winner after the first ballot because the GOP really wants to get in one of their own guys, get someone to win that nomination for president. Because after that convention, whoever the GOP picks, that's their presidential candidate, and that person will run against the heir apparent on the left, Hillary Clinton. We assume she'll, unless she's been indicted by then, that she'll be the candidate. So we end up with the fear that people will watch the convention and figure out the GOP is going to deprive the voters of the choice they wanted to make in this whole primary process and essentially impose a candidate through this brokering process, cut deals, promises made of all kinds that they can get enough delegates to get behind someone that the establishment actually wants. 
you know, the primary one was Jeb Bush. And I'm sure he's, I've actually met him a couple times. He's a perfectly lovely man. There is no oxygen in his campaign. He can't get, I don't know what he's at, 5% or something. He can't get enough attention from any, in, really in any state, to, to be even, be, hopefully, to be able to win a primary. So if the GOP were to manipulate this convention and inflict on the GOP primary voters a candidate that very few of them wanted— what that really tells the voters is you don't really have the power you thought you did. You don't have the power that we, you were intended to have by our founding documents. You don't have the power we the people. We, the ruling class, just like King George back at the time of our founding, we the ruling class in Washington, we tell you who the candidate is and you're going to live with it. And this is why there's so much suspicion because the reason that all these outsiders are so far ahead in the primary polling is because the prime, the GOP primary voting base is outraged at the way the GOP in Washington ignores the, the grassroots ignores the people who are trying to say, please do this. Please stop President Obama and his illegal amnesty. Please stop this Iranian deal. And, and nothing that the voters are ever saying to Congress seems to register. So this brokered convention, why is it going to matter to you? If it turns out that at the end of the day, we have a candidate emerge through deals the GOP cuts at the convention, a candidate emerge that nobody really wanted, and I'm sorry to say Jeb Bush is the primary one I'm thinking about, we are going to have, again, the GOP voting base stay home, as they did when President Romney was when not when not President Romney was the candidate, when Mitt Romney was a candidate, when John McCain was a candidate. The voting base is not going to turn out for someone uh, – who did not in any way stir up the passions of the primary voters throughout this whole election cycle and will have a victory by Hillary Clinton. And that's why it matters to you. It matters that we, we have a process that honors, to the extent possible, the wishes of the majority of the voters. And I'm telling you, folks, I am not a, a Donald Trump fan. This is not a Donald Trump speech but it, it, at all. But it is the idea that we have to insist the GOP, the RNC, the people with the hold the levers of power in Washington, listen to the people. This is Debbie George Aston. Ladies, can we talk? We're going to zip off to our break right now. And after our break, as I mentioned at the start, we have coming on the leadership team of the Young America's Foundation at SMU. They're here in the studio with me, which is fun. We have uh, Drew Wicker and Grant Wolf. So come back after a break to Ladies Can We Talk on 660 AM, The Answer.